Welcome to Art Power Hong Kong, everybody. Art Power Hong Kong is a collaborative campaign from the Hong Kong art community celebrating the arts in Hong Kong in 2020. I'm Rosanna Harris, Art Power Hong Kong working group member, and I'm delighted that you are joining us for the fourth instalment of the weekly Art Power Hong Kong online talks program. Today, we will explore heritage spaces in Hong Kong that are curating and facilitating contemporary programs. It is my pleasure to introduce you to your moderator for today, Oliver Giles, Executive Editor of Tala Asia. Oliver, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Oliver Giles. I'm Executive Editor of Tatla Asia, and I write about art, architecture, and design around the region. I'm very excited to be hosting this webinar today about historic spaces in Hong Kong that have recently been transformed into cultural centers and hubs for contemporary art and design. We have three great speakers to address the issue. We have Vanessa Jung, Managing Director of Nam Fung Development and founder of The Mills, a cultural and retail center occupying a series of old textile mills in Chunwan. Secondly, we have Marissa Yu, founding partner of the architecture studio SQ and executive director and co-founder of Design Trust, a grant funding platform that supports creative projects in Hong Kong and around the Greater Bay Area. Finally, we have Tobias Berger, head of art at Taekwon, a center for heritage and arts in central Hong Kong that occupies 16 historic buildings and two new buildings. To start with today, each of the speakers is going to give a short presentation, introducing themselves and the work they've done on heritage projects in the city. Then we'll have a group discussion, and then towards the end, I will be asking questions submitted by listeners. So while you're listening, if you have any questions for individual speakers or for the group as a whole, please drop them in the chat box on Zoom or on Facebook, and I will ask some of these questions towards the end. Vanessa is going to be the first to present today. So Vanessa, I will hand over to you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, thanks for having me today. Um, it's going to be a short presentation. We were told to only have three minutes, so I'll try to be brief and quick. And uh, thanks, Oli, for flipping the slides. So hi again, I'm Vanessa. And today I'm going to share with you guys the story of the mills. Next slide, please. So the mills, if you haven't been yet, is located in Chun Wan. It is a complex of three cotton mills, mills four, five, and six, uh, that were built in the 1960s. They were warehouses in, uh, uh, in 2008, and then when the textile business operation completely stopped. Uh, our purpose for the project was to create a space for creativity and to honor the industrial history of Hong Kong. It brings culture, innovation, and leisure under one roof. Um, and the mills officially opened its doors in December 2018. We just celebrated our first anniversary uh, right before the virus outbreak, so very blessed. Um, uh, it also proves that cultural projects um, is not limited uh, to any space or area. It's wherever the content can be built. Next slide, please. The mills consist the Mills project consists of, uh, oh, one before, sorry. The Mills consists of three pillars. First is Chat Center for Heritage Arts and Textile, a nonprofit art center. Uh, the second is Fabrica, a textile incubator and co-working space. And the third pillar is Shop Floor, which is an experiential retail shopping destination. All of these pillars are integrated as one experience for visitors uh, who come to the Mills. The entire complex is preserved and served as a walking museum itself uh, because we preserve mo most of the uh, industrial architecture and artifacts from, from back in the 60s. Next slide, please. For this presentation today, I'll focus on our art and cultural pillar, CHAT. Next slide. CHAT's manifesto is weaving creative experience for all. Um, it's one that is extremely key to defining our programming. This focus uh, helps us prioritize the inclusive participatory experience of all visitors, artists, and members of the community. Uh, next slide, please. At CHAT, uh, we welcome all of our visitors to be, an art, uh, to be active participants instead of passive observers. And we do this uh, through elements of co-learning, co-creation, and collaboration amongst all the various 
uh, constituents. Uh, next slide. Chat programs use textile as a metaphoric uh, subject to link up exhibitions and programming that rotate in three themes, which is contemporary art, heritage and design, and innovation. We have three seasonal exhibitions per year that integrate these themes fluidly. We also have a permanent exhibition at one of our galleries called the DH10 Foundation Gallery. Um, and that, on that, we display a narrative of the Hong Kong textile industry since the 1950s. Uh, many of them were untold stories from workers. Uh, so we've collected uh, lots of uh, oral history and also have uh, demonstrations of the old machines. Next slide, please. Through weaving these multiple threads of artists, designers, curators, students, retired workers, et cetera, et cetera, we envision um, to create a more engaged total experience that invites everyone, um, not only to be an observer, but a maker um, and of the program. Next slide. And all this um, happens because we, we are consciously always outreaching to community to work with, work with us. Uh, next slide. One of the examples I'll share with you is uh, an earlier one that we've done. Right before our opening, we've invited a Japanese, our artist, resident, artist in residence, uh, Yuki Taguchi, um, and he created this, weave, this dragon that was weaved together by the people in the neighborhood and the, all the materials collected and donated by other textile factories. Um, and we, we invited a, a, a local uh, dragon dance master to practice this dragon dance with us to prepare us for the opening. I'm sure some of you have seen it and it's still, it's now becoming, this dragon dance is becoming a yearly event in the neighborhood and it's very welcomed by everyone. Um, so since then we've been putting together lots of program and, uh, and lots of exhibition. We've just opened our new exhibition last two weeks, uh, but is now kind of forced to close because of the virus. But because of the virus, we've also come up with other initiatives. So people aren't, won't be missing out um, our new program, which is next slide. We themed it Museum from Home, which include virtual tours, talks and workshops that are supposedly um, uh, hosted in the chat space that, that's in preparation for like, because nobody really knows how long this is gonna last. And we're gonna share uh, some chat behind the scenes, the making of a type of uh, documentary and artist room. So we get intimate chats with, with the artists we work with and artwork participation from home, uh, which we can later collect and bring it together. Um, that's it that I'll share for today. I'll wait for questions and uh, happy to share more. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, I'll pass over to you, Marissa. Oh, Marissa, um, I can't hear you. Are you on mute? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Great, great. Hi, everyone. Um, again, thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's quite refreshing to to be in this context, uh, especially with the challenging times we face. Um, and a huge fan of what Vanessa has been doing at the mills and also, um, of course, what Tobias's projects at Haikun. Um, so just, uh, again, a few minutes uh, introduction. Um, co one of the co-founders and now executive director at Design Trust. Um, and next slide, a little bit of our history. Um, we've been very much invested in looking at processes um, of cultural engagement to build cultural ecosystems with many partners in positive ways. And um, we're actually now 13 years old um, and more actively in the last uh, seven years, uh, building up Design Trust as a grant a funding platform um, and to promote and encourage advanced um, design competency for the benefit of the public. And we've always naturally been quite um, interested in questioning what heritage is, um, what is cultural development in the region. And next slide um, sort of shares and summarizes how in the last uh, few years, we've been working uh, quite closely with our board members, our patron community to connect the design community together um, in, a, in a radically different way where we're also 
actually just learning by doing um, and experimentation of how to utilize um, public resources in a way that can also benefit um, the community. So not too different to what the Mills is doing, um, but what's been quite fascinating is the kind of community spirit and generosity of um, the different stakeholders to participate in generating the cultural landscape. Um, and so some of our activities have been related to grant giving. Um, this particular slide, I was just digging out with my colleagues and team, um, sharing a little bit about our past um, and investing in some of the programs that um, relate to the nonprofit community before some of these uh, public heritage sites are now. So there's one really exciting um, drawing diagram, I suppose, photograph um, during the West Kowloon before um, uh, the Bi-City Biannual in 2009. Uh, the NGO also in 2010 um, did, a, did a series of projects and two-week activations um, at the Victoria Prison, which is now Tycoon. And also before uh, Police Mary Quarters um, PMQ, um, our foundation also supported activation of these sites. Um, so that's very much part of um, <clears throat> the foundation and design trust's purpose. Um, but over time, we've realized, um, next slide, is the, <clears throat> the role of the community for research um, and archival projects is, is lacking. So as we move through the next slides, um, just some examples of the programs we've been doing. Um, used to be much more mass engagement but now looking more precisely at topics and themes and grant giving. So another case example <clears throat> of work we've been doing relating to heritage, um, this is Indonian Chan, also pulled this up because Oliver did this beautiful uh, interview with him. Um, he's been one of our younger graduates, grantees who discovered um, lack of research on Bei Wei Kai Shu, a Chinese calligraphy style on all the lights and signboards in Hong Kong, um, and very uniquely Hong Kong and also Macau. Uh, but what's fascinating is um, his own, own sort of self-initiation and the foundation supported his research um, into looking very closely at the historic um, archival materials. And now he's innovating um, to hopefully bring this Bay Way calligraphy into a modern typeface um, with um, WhatsApp, Photoshop, and, and calligraphy. The other kind of work we're doing is supporting um, the next slide. Thanks, Oliver. Um, Neon Sign Archives, this is Brian and Necky's research um, from the Poly U, also collecting about 2,000 pre digital um, neon sign hand drawings from the local Sifu in Hong Kong. Um, and we're very pleased to have a lot of exciting uh, younger designers um, and researchers in the next slides, like Sharon DeLista, also collecting um, rich stories, stories of cultural histories, et cetera, of and ethnic minorities. Um, and finally, some of the more exciting work lately is how to translate um, Hong Kong architectural archiving um, into questions of what cultural landscapes are. So young architects, designers, and the foundation, um, in essence, from Design Trust, next slide, um, have given these uh, wonderful grant opportunities uh, to produce physical work, like pavilions, um, to, to accelerate their own career journey, um, and also taking over certain narratives and histories to identify what is Hong Kong, what is our rich history, whether tangible and tangible within the cultural context. Um, and just to quickly close, I, I'll, I'll share a little bit more later because I know um, the topic is uh, focused a lot on, on how heritage is used in contemporary practice. Um, the next slide um, just shares a, a new program project we launched uh, three years ago uh, called Design Trust Future Studios, um, a cultural mentor mentee think tank um to support younger graduates and designers 10 years out of school to be mentored um, it's a very exciting program i can share a little bit more later but i think the last few slides give a taste of um, some of the programs we've been doing lately in historic buildings uh, one example in this 1930s building um, that was um, actually 
offered up to the government. Um, unfortunately, part of it was demolished and um, we had a great opportunity to look at some of the archives and invite designers and, and um, researchers to create uh, new works from a site-specific approach. So that's, that's what we've been doing. We can share a little bit more and I'm very excited to be part of this panel. And um, our, our goal is to look at a topic of heritage is innovation, um, exploring, I would say, some difficult definitions of maybe what Hong Kong identity is and shaping new conversations of conservation. And our aim is through these programs to build new narratives um, and make it more dynamic and accessible to the public at large. Yeah, so that's what we've been doing. I hope that's my three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa. Yeah. Um, finally, Tobias, can you please give a short introduction to Taekwon? Yeah, thank you everybody for having me here. Um, yeah, a quick introduction to Daigon and Daigon uh, Contemporary. Um, the next slide, please. Um, okay, if, um, I think the biggest idea about um, Daigon is the idea of connectivity. And it came from the idea of Herzog de Moron, who are the master planner of the new Daigon, because formerly the former police station and the central magistrate and Victoria prison were really three independent entities. And the idea was to bring things together, to bring heritage and contemporary together, to bring the outside community in and to bring together these three um, very historic monuments. And we opened in 2018. Um, we had about four, four and a half million people until, until then. And as many of you know, um, it is actually a partnership between the Hong Kong government and the Hong Kong Jockey Club that then basically built a new company, which is called um, Daiguan. Um, next slide. Um, okay, yeah. our vision is really to um, revitalize um, Daiguan. That means we don't want to be just a heritage site. We really want to have things happening here and use the old buildings into something new. So we have heritage. Obviously, we have eight um, heritage spaces. We have contemporary art. We have performing arts and, um, and also we have um, what we call lifestyle or enjoyment, which is basically, and if you look at the next slide, um, which is basically um, F&B, um, yeah, food, beverage, and retail. Um, it was very clear from the beginning that um, it should be a third of um, retail and, and, yeah, retail and um, restaurants, a third of heritage and art, and third, a third of retail, um, of, um, of um, open space. So it's very, it's very clear this is not a commercial space. It is really a place to, um, to bring culture and contemporary art back to um, Hong Kong Central. Um, next slide. Um, my, my role here is as head of art. I'm basically the director of the Hong Kong, um, of the visual arts here at Daigun. Um, that happens mainly, but not only, in these new galleries. And here again is that idea of connectivity. Because Herzog de Moron have not only built a new, or basically two new buildings into the site, and the, uh, the new gallery building and the new auditorium, but they have connected these buildings with the old. You see that on the slide to the right, um, where you see that we have two um, new galleries, and but also one big gallery in the old F Hall, which is actually the former women's prison um, and was built originally as, an, um, as a printing house. So if you look at the next slide, you see that we are really blessed with very different gallery spaces. In the new building, we have about a thousand square meters new white cube gallery space, very museum-like, wooden floors, very clean. But then with F Hall, we have a space that is much older, that's much more industrial. And we see that different exhibitions need different spaces and um, we can use these different spaces um, very, very nicely because they're all connected with that wonderful concrete staircase, that spiral staircase we have in the gallery. Um, but what is important mostly is certainly the program. And if you look at the next slide, um, I think all, not all, but most of our program is really also connecting that heritage of the site um, to the contemporary. It's bringing like, being very aware that we are in the old Victoria prison and um, that we are in, the old, in an old site of law and order and using that idea as, an, as a jumping board for exhibition. The first exhibition, Dismantling the Scaffold, was a great start because it talked about punishment, it called, talked about confinement, talked about all these things, and 
Christina Lee, who curated that ex exhibition, really also made a great job, not only having that topic, but also bringing a lot of local artists together with international artists. Um, another example of that is the next slide, um, is um, Violence of Gender, which was maybe our most um, challenging exhibition. Um, it talked about um, structural violence against um, certain um, gender stereotypes. It had a lot of quite outspoken works in it. Um, but it's also important to, to actually tackle these topics and not only make pleasant, wonderful exhibitions, but also bring art to Daigun that on the one side is connected to the heritage of the site, but also ask contemporary questions. Um, our art, and you see that in the next slide, um, does not happen only in the galleries. Um, we have also a big um, contemporary art or public art program. But again, all we do, especially in public art, has to connect to the heritage of the site. Um, you see the Lawrence Wiener, which is uh, a statement to the old brick building of Efol, Nadim Abbas and Izumi Kato also reacting um, right on the facade um, of the old Daigun. And, um, but it is in the end, and you see that next slide, you see that next slide, it is about um, bringing people back to Daigun. Um, here you see the exhibition, uh, not actually, it's not an exhibition, it's our annual book fair, which is very successful every January, where we have like seven, 8,000 people coming to Daigun and um, looking at artist book and art books. But also part of that is a big a commission or art, various commissions to local Hong Kong artists because that's very, very important for us that we can also commission new art by local and international artists to produce new art here um, in Daigun. Thank you. Great, thank you all. Um, there's clearly a lot for us to sh talk about um, and discuss. This is a huge topic. Um, but before we dive into the individual projects, I'd like to talk um, briefly about how converting heritage spaces in Hong Kong into cultural centers is actually a relatively new development. I think even 10 years ago, perhaps even five years ago, conservation and preservation of heritage sites really didn't seem to be very high on the agenda in Hong Kong. But now we are seeing so many of these spaces really get new leases of life. Um, Marissa, as an architect and as someone who's been involved in Design Trust for many years, um, do you believe there's been a shift in attitude towards heritage spaces? And if so, what do you think has changed? What's the reason this attitude has changed? I, I mean, it's such a great question because I, I think it's also the, um, I, I was thinking about the reaction, uh, I suppose a lot of discussions about the 2006 um, demolition of Star Ferry Pier caused such a huge outcry, right, in our local community. Um, and I think that sort of period of time, uh, 2006, seven, there was a real hunger to restore and question um, the use of architectural development, urban redevelopment proposals and policies. And, and so I think that really engendered this, this kind of interest and fascination because in the 06, 07, um, you know, the heritage commissions, uh, the kind of government sites, local grassroots, um, really had this craving for, um, in essence, giving, you know, more of a, a sense of place, right? So I think that, that engendered a lot of discussions. Um, at that same time, you know, I was showing some earlier slides that um, a very humble, small Hong Kong ambassador design, design trust, um, a good 13 years ago, we're also experimenting, how do we assist and support um, the activation of these public assets? Um, and with you know the West Kowloon Cultural District development um, and the kind of rethinking of how academic and academia plays a role, I think there's this kind of extreme cultural energy uh, to transform these places into sort of positive assets. Um, and I don't know, like from I was formerly also quite involved in uh, teaching and academia at Hong Kong U and Chinese U, and there were always a lot of fascination and research um, against, say, even like the Graham, Mar Graham Market uh, Renewal pro Project, um, these beautiful old antiquity monuments, um, and then with with all these commissions, I'm sure I'm sure Vanessa can talk about it. She sits on some boards. Uh, where this is activation of stakeholders um, investing into policy change, um, 
and looking at what, how do we create guidelines? Um, so I think it's been a collective um, approach from the public and private sector. And it's so incredible to see, um, you know, like the Mills project, which is a, a private uh, industrial heritage site transformed and obviously Tycoon um, and various other revitalization projects that have been rolled out uh, since uh, for the last 10 years. Yeah, so I think that's sort of the energy and interest. Um, and, you know, we're all from Hong Kong. So there's this constant flux of um, wanting to provide, um, you know, innovation within our city and um, and sort of both cultural drivers. So yeah, I think that's, that's a very important question for us uh, instead of these empty heritage sites um, without operational um, assets, then how do we come together as a community to activate them? Vanessa, <clears throat> with the mills, um, why did you personally decide to preserve it um, rather than maybe knock it down and build something new? And then once you made that decision, why was it so important to you that the development included space for contemporary art and design? Uh, well, it's personally where our family started, actually. My grandfather uh, built this factory when he first came to Hong Kong. So uh, when I first joined the company, which is now almost five years ago, and learned about that uh, the textile mills are still there, actually, um, using use, being used as a warehouse space, I thought it was kind of a waste. And, and I always had an interest in in heritage sites, actually, just old things in general. My dad always said I was born in the wrong, wrong period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's just a lot of sentimental value. And when I came back, I just thought that it's also the company's 60th anniversary by then. And I thought a lot of actually the, the newer employees, right, um, don't actually didn't know that we started off as a textile uh, business manufacturer. Um, and so, and textile industry was one of the biggest in Hong Kong, which brought us to like today's like economic status, I think, um, which is something that a, a lot of people took pride in. And a lot of people that we've talked to during the project research phase, um, pretty much I think everyone we've talked to have at least an immediate family or a relative um that uh that has worked at a textile mills let alone like then from textile mills um and so that was a very heartwarming story and and till now like still get me quite emotional and uh so i kind of took liberty to to plan out like a concept for this project and present it to to senior management and took them by surprise and of course also had a base case, which is redevelopment. And I think uh, family especially supported it, even though they know it's nothing we've done before. It's not something that a typical developer would do. And none of us have a textile background and none of us have museum or art background either. Um, so everything we've done is through outreach and help with like all all sorts of advisors and partners, um, experts. I think I've knocked on Larissa's door many times too to ask for like what what would what how can we create a meaningful space? Because we can create beautiful spaces, but what can be constructive and meaningful and inspirational, right? And um, the whole project is pretty much done in-house. Uh, the design is done by the in-house team. Um, so uh it was a big like exercise nobody thought it would be realized to be honest like i think i was probably the only one until like a month before the opening um <laughs> people people finally saw saw it actually built and happening and someone is like renting space from our from somewhere in tune one which everyone thought is impossible to get to um so uh um all in all it's a uh, Till now, people still call it a, a, a miracle. And I think it's really brought a breath of fresh air to a traditional, like old school real estate development uh, kind of business mindset that things can be done differently. 
and uh, and now Hong Kong has come to a generation where there's lots more heritage sites like coming up where actually I would say we're pretty like young I mean Tai Tai Gun is one of the oldest like heritage sites Hong Kong has and compared to you know the US or the UK or Europe where there's like buildings that are a few hundreds or like almost thousand year old ours are babies so I think that's also why we have so many more opportunities to do so much more heritage sites. And Tobias, um, why do you think so many of these heritage sites are being transformed into art spaces in particular, rather than being adapted for other uses? What, what about heritage buildings makes them interesting art spaces? Now, I think um, the one we forget to talk about is 1881, right? It's the one in TST, which was a complete disaster. Let's say it what it was, and, um, or is. It's a shopping mall for luxury goods. Um, and I think that um, after that, um, a lot of people understood that this is not um, the way to go forward. I think people learned a lot from that, from that, um, from that project. And, um, my personal understanding is also, um, I think after, after the handover, there was this idea of a Hong Kong identity. And certainly identity has to do with buildings and has to be, do with architecture. And um, that was the other part uh, that came, came towards it. Um, Daigun was lucky enough that um, from the beginning onwards, it was written in the concept, which was done actually by the Asia Art Archive, um, that. Hong Kong needs a, a new contemporary art space because until then we didn't have that, right? Um, Parasite, which I was running in that time was, it was a small shop in Cheung Wan. And then the other ones were in the Cattle Depot, which is another, again, another heritage space, which um, was used for, for culture, but unfortunately doesn't work that well because um, of government regulations. Um, I think worldwide you have, you have that, um, um, there are a lot of heritage spaces that work very well for, for culture because they have an identity and both artists and um, curators can work with that ident identity. It's not a blank canvas, it's not a white cube. And we saw that with, um, um, with Christina's show, the first show I've shown slides of. We also saw it with the second show, the Chao Fei show. When she came in, um, she understood right away the great chance to make a movie here at Dagoon and to use that amazing background to make an, a feature film. And um, even um, Takashi Murakami, the big show we did, um, he came in and also he realized right away um, that there was this combination of heritage and contemporary um, that was very well preserved, very well made, um, that inspired him, but which is also inherent in his artwork. So I think um, heritage spaces give artists a really nice canvas to do something different and to work with it, but also sometimes against it. And I think that, um, that why, that's why especially new commissions are so important and um, site-specific exhibitions are so ex important. Um, that's, for example, why we decided not to take over any traveling exhibitions. We wanted that everything we do is tailor-made for Daigun and for um, Hong Kong. So Daigun combines um, as you said in your earlier presentation, contemporary buildings designed by Ozob Jinuran and um, this amazing compound of heritage buildings. Vanessa, when you were adapting the mills and revitalizing the mills, did you ever consider adding new buildings to that development in the same way? Or were you totally focused from the beginning on preserving the existing site? Uh, we just focused on um on uh, uh, revitalizing the existing site. Actually, we, we took out space. Uh, we carved out a big atrium space and installed a skylight because factory spaces aren't usually the most pleasant to walk around mm -hmm. with. And we wanted to create also a very pleasant um, workspace for Fabrica as well. Um, so uh, it took a lot of people by surprise that we're losing GFA, which is like very precious in Hong Kong. And, uh, but in order to create something that people can come to and, and would actually enjoy and use it as a hangout space, um, that's what you'll need to do architecturally design. 
So we never thought of adding space. And Marissa, you've been involved a little in the revitalization of Hall Palm Mansion through your Minecraft Future Studio project, which is a very different heritage project to either the Mills or Taekwon, in that it's a almost totally painstaking restoration. Um, yeah. How did that process and seeing that process um, inspire you? And why did you decide to get Design Trust involved with that project? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was actually quite organic because um, back in 2014, I was also tracing and tracking the process. Um, one of the um, executive directors of the, that foundation, um, Roger and his colleagues, um, and as I visited over a couple of years, um, I realized how magical this, this house is. And at the same time, it really unbelievably has so much rich history about entrepreneurship of the Tiger Bomb uh, co-founders who were actually originally um, Burmese. Hong Kong had projects in Singapore, but from Fujian in China. So the complexity of the, the actual family background was also a huge inspiration. Um, at the same time, uh, obviously we knew it was, um, you know, in the 2000, it had to, the owners had to, to sell it, unfortunately. But then there was another uproar and um, the Tiger Bomb, beautiful gardens that were built in the 40s, late 30s was demolished which was actually one of the most incredible, uh, you know, growing up in Hong Kong, one of these incredibly strange places, um, but had so much uh, collective memory for the, the community in Hong Kong. And also as Tiger Balm founders, they were really entrepreneurial. They were selling Tiger Balm ointments um, and they had really these incredible stories and murals um, all over the place. At the same time, it was one of the first in 19, late 1930s, the first public space uh, garden. Uh, so this is something our foundation has been fascinated with is the utilization of public space. And this was the first sort of ent quasi entertainment public space free to the local Chinese public. Um, and the details, the asymmetry of, of the gardens, the moldings of the architectural features, um, became a huge inspiration. Um, so I was very lucky. We managed to get the Hall Pa uh, architects and foundation to open up the site to us before it was open to the public. Um, and we uh, commissioned young designers from the Design Trust Foundation um, with special challenges and briefs to be mentored by these really wonderful architects um, and create new work. So as, as what Tobias was saying, I think the site context and site specificity is really challenging to achieve in Hong Kong. Um, but once you have these historic sites, um, which can be learning devices and also can transform and build curiosity, um, I think that was the lens we, we took the approach. Um, and through that process, we were able to discover a lot of untold uh, narratives uh, that could hopefully shape social history and narratives and um, design research um, and architectural archives. Um, how did, you, uh, uh, how did you see contemporary designers respond to the space? What were the results of this project? Yeah, you know, I, I did prepare a few slides. Um, is it too much to ask that? I mean, there's one particular slide of Elaine's project, which I would, if, if we have time, just a minute, I could quickly talk through. And no. yeah, no, the, uh, it would be right at the bottom. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, no, this is a fascinating, um, little anecdote. Uh, when we when we visited in 2018 um, and also later on studied some of the pho photograph archives, um, there was this 1940s old photograph from the former owners. It wasn't a perfect depiction of the old carpet. It was sort of pixelated and collaged. Um, so we questioned, you know, as a design brief to 
Elaine um, and her mentors, Neri and Hu from Shanghai, how could you recreate um, that sense of place and, and question authenticity? So it became this part of the Future Studio program, it was an 18 month long process. Very lucky to, to get um, Taiping Carpets Manufacturer as one of our partners who opened up some of their factories in Xiamen in China and subsequently, um, you know, even taught us how to do knotting and, and fabrication techniques. Um, so Elaine uh, looked at this photograph and through her also research process um, through the foundation uh, has been in, investing in a lot about uh, textile materi material. So what's really fascinating with this as a case example of um, site specific condition is we worked with Antiquities Monument Office uh, who were in the beginning quite, you know, uh, distant, but became closer and more interested and fascinated on our process. Um, so what's fascinating, originally there's a phoenix. Phoenix is sort of the king of all birds, but it also is a symbol of virtue and grace. And something we discovered is it's part male, part female. So Elaine also had to uh, work with Michelle from Taiping to find the right um, motif that would pass to the, the Antiquities Monument Office. Um, but at the same time, it's a symbol of femininity, et cetera. So she discovered um, also along the way, new materials. And this is the first time uh, the six meter carpet, uh, that is a, not a true replication of the original, but a, a kind of advancement of innovation. She introduced 10 new interactive yarns uh, that reacts to the light, the daylight, and also to UV and heat sensitivity. So there's something really beautiful about the process of the research of the original photograph, innovating with um, old manufacturers to produce new combinations. And if you look really close, there's a grid of the wood parquet floor that seamlessly also underlines the grid of the carpet. So Elaine did this beautiful um, piece that we're also extremely excited to showcase in other sites in the future and um, also respond to the site context in a very dynamic way. And similar to you know, what Vanessa has been doing, we've, we've also hosted a few public tools and educational tools and um, it's been a real sense of discovery and curiosity through uh, the process of making um, and critiquing and being critical about our heritage. Yeah, so that's one example. I can go on and on, but I don't want to take over too much. <laughs> okay, maybe we can come back later. Um, yeah. Vanessa, how have you seen artists respond to the mills? Um, I know you've had several major commissions and I know Michael Lynn um, made a major big work for the mills. Um, all the artists we work with um, actually really understands the community involvement aspect that we 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 pride ourselves in actually um, he with Michael Lynn uh, we've done big pieces of furniture and he took inspiration of uh, local fabric prints that you find in like markets or it's a sentimental print uh, of of uh, of someone who's on the team and so he worked with uh, some of the students um, that we've invited uh, through in the community to create like uh, from to show like to show them how his creation process is. Uh, so we created the furniture with Michael Lynn along with the students and um, from like uh, translating the prints into these large format uh, furniture benches and tables which are now at the at chat. Um, the lounge space and how to translate that onto furniture and how to paint them um, on with with a certain technique and so the whole process is very educational but also um, uh, preserve certain parts of heritage and local local flavor I would say uh, and it really um, resonates with a lot of the visitors who come and a lot of times with all the I think most of the artists we've worked with uh, always want to come back to work with us again because of um, the response or the inspiration they've gotten and how they can really like 
work with the community. So like the earlier one I said with Yuki, with the dragon, um, he's, he's actually going to come back uh, and we're going to make a lion. Um, so um, that will be his probably the fourth time coming back to work with us. Um, and, and it's very encouraging to see. And I think um, part of it um, the art for the artist is, is also quite new to be so involved locally. But of course, we also found artists that actually understand how to work with communities. Um, Tobias, you mentioned Chafe earlier. Um, what other what are the other interesting what other interesting projects have artists made in response to interesting, I think the most interesting projects are always the next ones, right? Um, but um, <laughs> in general, I think um, we have produced, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen projects with artists. And um, it is, as, as Vanessa say, it's on the one side, it's a place where you are, but it's also the team you have. And I think um, what both the mills and, and we now and other institutions, we, we build up these amazing teams that can actually support artists and that can tell them where they are and that can give them the history. Um, in the mills, it's obviously um, with Vanessa having a, a long history with that museum, but here we have a heritage team um, where we can work together with, so we can give um, artists a much better understanding of the place they are in and the place they, they are working in. But it's also um, that I think being so close in these communities, we also know now the people that can do um, amazing, amazing projects. Um, for example, um, Nadim's work, which you saw the, um, the furniture on the prison yard, um, that was done by the same guy that um, did the concrete of our um, spiral staircase. And, we would and there's only one guy in Hong Kong actually that can do projects like that. And we would not have known them um, without knowing him from that spiral, project, um, spiral staircase project. Um, so it is not only that heritage you are in, but it's also the heritage of craftsmanship that, that I think was very important here in Dagoon to develop um, during the whole process, um, redeveloping um, the site. And, um, and the teams and the connections into the community um, to know people that can produce a dragon, or as Vanessa said, and to know the other um, companies that give you fabrics and so on. So it's, um, it's a living heritage, right? And this, this heritage is not only about um, architecture and building, it's about how you, feel the, uh, how you fill these buildings and how you connect again artists with craft people and with your personal, um, and with your individual team that, that works in these spaces for, for, I mean, we work now on Dagoon since four years, um, I think the Mills is also working since um, three, four years on that project. And I think it is really the, the connections you make and you use architecture as a base, but it's also the history of, the, of this architecture and the history of, the, of and, um, experience of these people. Mm -hmm. um, Vanessa was talking earlier about the history of the Mills and the emotion tied up in that with her family. Um, the history of Taekwun is also an incredibly emotional one, but maybe for different reasons. Um, it was partly a prison, um, and there are definitely some dark aspects to its history. Um, do you think it's important that artists you work with explore that? Yes, as I hopefully said in the beginning, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, we didn't want to make that into a Disneyland site where we only celebrate, um, celebrate not celebrate, but do kind of nice, amusing art. I think it was with most of the exhibitions, both the curators and the artists um, know very well where they are and, um, and respond to that um, mixed history. Sure, I mean, this was a prison. A lot of bad things happen in prison. A lot of dark things have happened in prison. Um, but also a lot of um, interesting things, um, nice things happened here. Um, one doesn't want to understand that, but there are a lot of friendships formed, there are a lot of um, connect connections again between um, different police, the, the police force is very attached to that side. Um, the, um, so it is, it is a strong history which we take very, very serious. And I, I learned a lot because in the beginning I really thought um, we are doing 
a project where we see Hong Kong as a center, maybe central as a center, and then we go outwards. But for us nowadays, we really see Daegun and Victoria Prison as our, our base from where we work, um, from where we work onwards to. And um, that works not with every exhibition, but I think the really exciting exhibitions, um, like the Chow Fei exhibition, the Violence of Gender exhibition, Dismantling the Scarfold exhibition, but even, um, even the Contagious City exhibition, which we did about viruses um, just one year ago, one year ago um, was very much based on the history of Daegun. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions have come in from listeners. Um, the first one is specifically for you, Vanessa. Um, it says, they've, the listener who's anonymous has asked, what's the strategic direction of the mills five years down the road, extending the local textile legacy and history while incubating artists? Would there be a specific scope or topic driving the programs? Uh, I think we're all always quite growing quite um, organically, like what we've done now is using textile as a theme. Um, so textile itself is a heritage theme, but we also focus on the innovation side, which we call tech style, uh, to play on words. Um, so that side is where Fabrica focuses on, on uh, which is a textile incubator, uh, co-working space uh, to a platform um, to create a uh, to, to help foster like startups in the textile themed. Um, in terms of textile heritage, both the mill shop floor um, and chat will keep exploring ways to, to explore how textile touches the community. Um, so usually our winter exhibits or shows are more based on like more academic. Um, and then um, the spring show is more um, say like more contemporary art focus. Um, but then um, uh, the summer program is usually where, where there's lots of lots of different hands-on workshop. Like last year, we worked with NS Harsha and we've paired his exhibition with um, lots of uh, organic growing. Like we work with a bunch of organic farmers in Hong Kong to farm in the mill's roof, um, for, uh, farming indigo dye, natural indigo dyes and and vegetables and to explore how these uh, natural ingredients can become colors or flavors and play a big part in our lives. Um, so I think it's really, um, we're trying to find ways to connect not just art, but creativity um, and heritage uh, back, back to people's lives. So nothing is like truly prescriptive, but it should be inspirational and cross-generational. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question is, can be directed towards Vanessa again and also to Tobias. Um, do you acquire any of the art displayed at your institutions? Are you building up collections? And if not, why? Tobias, you want to go first? <laughs> yes. I mean, in general, we are, we are a non-collecting institution. We, we are part, um, we are like a Kunsthalle and I think the freedom of not collecting art is a great advantage because when you produce new works or um, do exhibitions, you really can think about the now and what's important now. And in, but you and you don't have to build, uh, produce, or show artworks that may or may not fit into the collection. However, um, we do have actually a quite huge collection of artist books, and um, we have that amazing. Um, library of Asian artist books, which has about over a thousand titles now, um, which is a great asset because that really gives us um, a, a lot of inspiration from artists and from different kind of art here in Hong Kong, in, in China and beyond. And it, it is a, for a lot of people that come into our space, it's the first time they see something like an artist book um, or art made, or, yeah, art made for books, um, for book for books and that then got us into making the Artist Book Fair, which is another very, very successful um, um, project we have. So, um, yeah, no, we do not collect um, big objects or, or, or sculptures or paintings. Um, we collect artist books, but also these books are made for use. We don't collect any old 
or um, any old or precious artist books. We only collect books which we can leave out freely and everybody can read them because we want them to be accessible. And after a year, and if they are used, we just have to unfortunately buy a new one, but that's also nice because we can constantly renew the collection. Uh, we are also non-collecting, but um, there are pieces that we commission or the artists work with us um, specifically with um, that we keep or we use them as traveling exhibitions. Um, so yeah, we, we don't collect. Um, I think the last question, I know we're coming to the end of our time now, um, is a question for all three of you. Um, if we could start with you, Marissa. Um, the question is, what are your respective institutions or organizations doing in response to the COVID-19 crisis? Great question. Um, yeah, and it's, it's been a real tough, I actually had a, a huge meeting yesterday. Um, I'm planning to launch our next Future Studio program um, that would be in relationship to these uh, quite serious questions on um, the provision for our community for supporting more grants um, for designers to to work on specific targeted projects. We've actually had a, a pretty wide range community um, in Hong Kong and also the US um, who are doing a lot of testing with 3D printing um, to innovate for frontline medical workers. Um, I'm also planning, I don't want to announce it yet, but we are planning our next Future Studio program, which will be inviting mentors and, and young designers to um, tackle a design brief that hopefully will have uh, longer term strategies for underprivileged families and um, really look at these questions on the, the digital divide. Um, so that's one component. Um, the, the sad thing though is true, we're, we're very Hong Kong based, but we're very global in terms of our connections. Um, yes, this is kind of a quick answer. There's a lot we have to do. Um, my other half at the university, my partner in, um, is doing also a lot of technological mapping. And um, I think we're all facing new challenges and um, we're, we're taking this quite seriously too, but we're hoping we can work together with the community. Yeah. Vanessa? Uh, I think on the chat side, like I mentioned in, my, in the very beginning, uh, we're launching um, Museum From Home. So uh, lots of workshops and initiatives and artist talks that people can have access to during this time like shelter in place, work from home, whatever you call it. Um, but also we hope to be able to open um, the, the, the exhibition, the spring exhibition um, soon. And we've already planned to extend it because we've, we have to catch up with lost time. And I know a lot of institutions out there actually postpone or cancel any opening of new exhibition, but the team has worked hard and charged through the virus and nobody got sick and we opened actually successfully and have and thankfully had quite a quite good attendance for the preview private preview before before all the all the more stringent like lockdown rules um, were in place so we opened for one day and, <laughs> and then had to close um, but so everyone, please stay tuned with, or, or join us in Museum From Home. Um, on Fabrica side, we are continuously like in touch, uh, doing lots of webinars and uh, public ones and very industry spe specific ones or startup specific ones for the community to help. Uh, a lot of the startups that we work with or that we know of um, are in like survival mode now. So we're trying our best to get, get them through this hurdle. And um, I guess sometimes just being there for them um, is important and having them share their experiences and, and how to overcome this or to come up with creative ways in, in transforming their businesses um, or getting more like online engagement or utilizing this time to build other parts of the business um, is what we're trying to help them to do. 
um, in terms of tenants, we're trying our best to also support them best as they can. Uh, but most likely, uh, mostly, I think it's to really stay nimble and adaptive and responsive. Finally, to Maya. Yeah, I make it sure. In, in our case, it's quite nice because we can just look back. I mean, we just did only a few months ago an exhibition called Contagious Cities. And it was exactly about the idea about um, contagion and the virus. We did it together with the Welcome Trust, which is one of the best and most prominent um, organizations in the world, um, actually for the scientific research on viruses and, and um, the challenges that brings it with it. And um, looking back at that exhibition, it is exactly that kind of exhibition um, which we should have, which we should do. And I'm, I'm glad we did it. A lot of people at that time were asking us, why are you doing an exhibition like that? We, you know, Hong Kong is so scarred with, um, with SARS. Um, a lot of people told us actually not to do that exhibition. It was probably our most, um, yeah, most controversial exhibition. And now you look, you look at this exhibition and we had all this reading room, which had all the literature there. We had a lot of art there, a lot of knowledge and a lot of artists that worked with that topic. So um, it's good to do these kind of challenging exhibitions. And I think um, that's what all these institutions should um, hopefully do in the future. And um, the other thing is, and I completely agree with Vanessa, um, our main job now is to open again and to give people um, spaces um, to come together again, to discuss again, to be challenged again, but also to feel home again and to, um, and the great space both, as uh, a great thing both for the mills and I think for Dagoon is the public open space that we can, that we have and that we can provide to people that we are not, um, that we are not cramped like a lot of shopping malls, or a lot of department store, but that we can just invite people to stroll around, to spend their time outside of their, of their apartments and, um, and to see things that are interesting and challenging. And um, therefore, we are currently also setting up the next exhibition. We have no idea when we're going to open it, but whenever we can, um, it will be ready to be opened. And um, we hope um, and we look forward to see people coming again, because I think the biggest surprise was how well both the Mills and Daigun was accepted by the general public. How, how many people came and how, how many people came to see exhibitions and spaces um, that are challenging and that are different and some of them are quite out of the way and um, they are very, very welcomed by the public and I think we look forward to see many more of these um, um, heritage spaces converted in some kind of art and culture um, entities. Yes, I think we can all keep our fingers crossed that we'll see more spaces like this emerge in the future. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your stories and your insights into this topic. Um, before we say goodbye, I just want to say a big thank you to Art Power Hong Kong. Um, the initiative and organization that has brought us together today and is also doing a huge amount um, to support the arts community during this period of uncertainty for everyone in Hong Kong and around the world. Um, you can find out more about Art Power HK's initiatives on its website, artpowerhk.com. Um, and there's also a crowdfunding, crowdfunding campaign live um, to make sure this can keep going um, and that we can keep doing keep everyone strong during this difficult time. Um, but thank you all again. And I hope we can meet in person soon. Yeah, thanks Oliver. Thank, thank you. you thank, thank you. you. Stay safe everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.